And where you are in the world today, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for taking time out from all of your incredibly busy schedules, whether you're working from home or back in the office, or I think many of you might be lying in bed with your iPads. That's totally fine. We're not going to judge. Um, this is hopefully the first of many webinar webinars uh, that is hosted by the Spark Labs groups. And um, I'm being bombarded with multiple windows and screens here, but oh, here we go. Um, so I want to give a shout out to uh, Spark Labs Group, uh, which is a network of start startup accelerators and venture capital funds. They've invested in over 280 startups across the US, Asia, and Europe. And it's because of Spark Labs Group that all of us have a connection, um, not just internet, but a little bit more that brings us all together here today. Um, this is new to all of us here, so um, please bear with us if there's any technical glitches or any sort of hiccups here and there. Um, to kind of give you an overview of how we're going to run this uh, show today, um, this webinar today, is uh, first of all, it'll go for about an hour. <coughs> and um, during the, uh, the chat, um, there will be a window set to the side. Um, a Q&A window. So for any of you who have any questions of anything to anybody on the panel, please feel free to write it down and jot it down. And um, we will have one of our esteemed Spark Labs uh, colleagues who will be reading the questions and filtering them and be feeding it to us at the end of our panel. And we will open the floor for about 15 to 20 minutes of questions um, to each of our distinguished panelists. So without further ado, I'm gonna do a quick intro of who is here. Um, we have a, ooh, we have two windows that say Spark Labs Group, Spark Labs, and then we have Rich Lim, who is not supposed to be there, but bear with us. Rich, we gotta kick you off, buddy. Scram. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so the first uh, thing that we will be doing is, um, Okay, can you guys see the screen? Are we good? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, today's topic is uh, innovations in music during these uncertain times. And we'll be going around the horn here um, to Tuhin Roy, because in Asia, seniority always rules and be happy you're the only <laughs> one of the group. <laughs> I'm not sure I like this. Top of the lineup. <laughs> SVP of New Digital Music and Innovation at the Universal Music Group. Um, and then on the poster, looking really good um, and also look very different today, is Jason Ma, our serial entrepreneur over on the West Coast, or as some would like to say, the best coast. Um, Co-founder of 88 Rise Stampede Ventures and co-owner of uh, the new thrilling application known as Triller. Next, we have Michael Shadell, the CEO of Kissway Mobile. For many of you who do not know what Kissway is all about, you're probably familiar with one of their biggest projects and biggest clients yet to date, a BTS. Um, they just had a massive online performance recently, and Michael is here to talk all about that. And last but not least, Sungmoon, no relation Cho the founder and CEO of Chart Metric, and me, Bernie Cho, the uh, moderator and president of DFSB Collective. So we're gonna start first with uh, Tuhin. Um, now it's just a moment, let me get this mouse thing going. Uh, oh, okay, Tuhin, as the um, head of uh, Universal Music's um, new digital businesses and digital innovation, I was wondering if you could talk about, hold on one second, I gotta stop sharing here. Uh, just bear with me. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about is, you know, when we started 2020, right when the Grammys just rolled around, everybody was in a good mood. 2019 was a fantastic year. Everyone was thinking 2020 was gonna be bigger and better business plans all set in stone, all set in cement, everybody's ready to go. When was the moment you realized that um, things potentially could go sideways? When was the moment that hit you that everything that you had planned and that you had sort of envisioned was gonna go 
just off the rails? Yeah, it's such a good question. Great, great to be here. And yeah, I appreciate the, the invite. Um, you know, it's always like oftentimes when I, when I gather with a group of people, you know, I think about the, the physical thing that we're missing. And I know you all were going to do, you know, a big in-person event in Seoul and in June. And, you know, my, my heart longs to see everyone in person again soon, but it's great to see you this way. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, in the beginning of February, I did a trip through, uh, through London and then through the Middle East to India and looped around India and back through the Middle East to LA. And I saw, you know, the, you know, the, that there was a lot more concern about this disease as I traveled uh, east. Uh, but when I got back to LA, the week of, uh, of, of March 3rd, I think it was March 3rd, I went to a Clippers game that I'd been invited to. And I was really nervous about it. I, you know, there, there were, I don't think there were confirmed cases or if there were, there were just a couple in LA at that time. Um, and, you know, we kind of, I was with some friends and we kind of like were sheepishly wearing masks, but a little bit embarrassed because most people weren't. But there was a moment where I was standing up in the box at the Staples Center um, and looking out at, at a packed house and just thinking to myself, the disease is here, it's gotten here. And just, you know, at that moment, I realized that, that the world was really going to change. Um, and then in terms of the myriad of projects that you were financially or perhaps just even emotionally invested and curious about, which ones did you feel once the pandemic hit and unfortunately hit its stride? Um, which sort of projects did you feel got perhaps maybe accelerated as a result of the pandemic to maybe more mainstream acceptance? And then perhaps also um, certain projects or technologies or platforms that you thought maybe got derailed or delayed due to the unpredictable right. impact of the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's, it's super surprising, you know, kind of, um, you know, the companies that have seen a positive impact versus a negative impact. I mean, first of all, I just got to acknowledge that, you know, for entrepreneurs that have been out there hustling, putting together businesses around, you know, the live business. I mean, this is, this has really sucked. So I, you know, I think about some great, you know, for example, um, uh, venue band connection marketplaces like Gigmore and Red Pine, um, you know, really kind of trucking along, very creative entrepreneurs, very solid teams, uh, really moving in the right direction. And of course, it's been, you know, very, very disruptive for them. On the other hand, you know, you know, we're seeing all kinds of acceleration of, of digital transformation. I'm sure Jason can speak more to uh, to Triller specifically, but I've seen some of the numbers around the short video services and what's happened. You know, as as um, you know, more and more countries went to lockdown, and I knew we knew there would be a bump, but there was like the acceleration's been really really significant. And I think some of those um, kind of explicitly um, understood the cultural moment and and really kind of leaned heavily into into that and. Um, got not just sort of, you know, a bump uh, that is reflective of people spending a lot more time on their screens, but, you know, um, you know, really drew in more engagement by, uh, by, by coming out and meeting people where they, where they are. Um, so, you know, we've definitely seen that across, you know, all of the short video services. Um, and then there have been some things that have just literally started in response and you know it's 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 always amazing to see you know whatever that moment was for other people for me it was like march 3rd standing in the staples center um you know for a lot of other people had similar moments around that time in the u.s and there's you know there's another a number of entrepreneurs who um who recognized um you know that there was going to be this massive need for artists to connect with their fans through um through digital live performances which are obviously a completely different animal than, uh, you know, than an in-person event. But, um, but I think there was, there was almost like this, this simultaneous recognition among artists and fans that they needed to connect and needed to know that they could still do that. And so we saw this, you know, explosion of, of live streaming. And there are, there are a number of entrepreneurs who kind of understood that, um, that live streaming was gonna, was gonna explode and started to build um, curation platforms on top of that. So, uh, you know, Travis Laurendine, who's, a, who's a, a, a great guy in the music tech ecosystem and has run a bunch of hackathons for us and has the ability to marshal like these massive numbers of, of hackers to, to get behind his projects, 
got right on building uh, kind of a linear programmed um, uh, directory for live streams. So, you know, um, kind of like a Pluto TV for live music streams. Um, and more recently, um, we've seen- the name of that uh, particular service? Now it's uh, called um, Sofa King Festival, I think is what he, he called it. Um, playing Open, on Open, so Open, Open King Festival? Sofa, Sofa King. Oh, ah, okay, Sofa King yeah. Festival. Okay. Yeah, and then Matthew Adele, who is the, um, who is the CEO of Bport, also launched a, a similar service recently. And then the last thing I'll say about it is, you know, I think that there's, there's been a way that, you know, the intensity of the crisis and the suddenness of the crisis has accelerated the whole industry around, um, around live streaming. And, you know, there's been a kind of a chicken or egg problem where, you know, a number of companies that make a run at it. There's some complicated rights issues. Um, and there just hasn't been enough demand really to push through that. But then, you know, as this explosion happened, you know, I think it's, it's forced a lot of uh, players in the ecosystem to kind of figure out where they, they, they want to be with this and, um, and you know, helped uh, drive kind of an advance in, in the thinking about how you resolve the, the industry-wide business problems to make that, make that a reality. So it's, um, it's definitely had a huge impact on the entrepreneurial system around us. There's been some great stuff and there's been, you know, some people have been hit really hard. Now, you mentioned, obviously, um, for you, that sort of um, moment was at a Clippers game. But uh, if that was on March 3rd, uh, unfortunately, a few days later, I think for a lot of people in the entertainment industry, and, and particularly for people in the U.S., I think what caught them off guard about COVID, the coronavirus, was the fact that um, the disease didn't feel so distant, that it was people that they knew, people that they loved, but more importantly, the people that were famous that were getting this disease. And it's my understanding that um, your colleague, your boss, Sir Lucian Grange, was one of the first executives in the U.S. to be diagnosed with COVID, I believe, in mid-March, early March. Um, what was that day like? Because I just remembered that was just like breaking news, headline news when um, that occurred. And, uh, you know, obviously you share the same office building. What was that day like when um, you, you heard that uh, your boss, somebody in your building, um, actually had the disease? And... From that point on, um, what were things that um, you guys did as a company to really take this seriously, but more importantly, deal with it? Yeah, um, but thankfully, Lucian's doing a lot better. But yeah, he he, he was one of the first, and um, it was a very dramatic day. It was a Friday. Um, we all we all left the office at the end of the day, and you know I think that there was um, there was already discussion about closing the office, you know, fairly soon at that point. Um, but, but you're right that the whole thing seemed slightly distant and unreal at that time. And I think that was the first person I knew personally that, that, uh, that came down with it. And of course, you know, the, everyone who was in the building was evacuated at that point and, uh, and we never went back to the office again. So you're, you're right that it was a particularly kind of dramatic, uh, entry into, into the next phase of, of, of the, uh, of the crisis for us. Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, pop up another um, uh, visual for you here. Um, let's see. So two things that uh, Universal Music has sort of done prior, pr uh, prior to the pandemic, but it seems to be the talk of the town and, and pretty much around the world, is uh, number one, um, we're starting to see kind of an overlap and emergence and more importantly, convergence of synergies between esports video gaming and music. Uh, about uh, two years ago, um, Astroworks, one of your universal music uh, labels, um, did a deal with Ninja, the YouTube streamer slash uh, former pro gamer who made his name, made his mark in Fortnite. And you guys actually have a record deal with him where he's curating mm -hmm. a fantastic electronic music. And this was 2018. You guys got the sense that there was something there. And then moving forward, last year, not this year, everyone was talking about Travis Scott's big gig on Fortnite um, not too long ago. But you guys actually beat him to the punch and actually did something last year with Marshmallow. And his numbers were just through the roof. 10 million people simultaneously viewed that show. And so what I was wondering is, um, you know, and then obviously we saw Twitch, which was traditionally known as a gaming sort of uh, viewing platform 
becoming more and more um, a go-to platform for people in the music industry. For 2020, um, what are things that uh, for you at UMG, but more importantly, you as a music insider, executive and, and, and a fan, um, think we should be looking forward to and, and looking um, into for the year? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you'll see more of that. Um, you know, I, I'm, you know, I, I think that we, we have been early as a company. Um, this, there's another uh, initiative that our, um, that our team in Sweden undertook, which was um, to start to sign music specifically for, for video games. And that was even earlier. Um, so, you know, our labels have, you know, uh, you know, always, you know, are at, you know, obviously, you know, very in touch with culture as it emerges and have, have recognized that, you know, attention is, is going here and, and look, you know, been looking now for quite a while at how our artists can participate in that. I actually, you know, I think that the, the Marshmallow live concert in Fortnite and, you know, the Travis Scott um, concert that came after it, you know, are really some of the most innovative, um, you know, uh, new ways for artists to connect with fans I've ever seen. Um, it, you know, I, the the Travis Scott, um, you know, uh, uh, concert is like really, you know, just such a reimagination of what a concert is. The Marshmallow event was a little bit more literal, but it was the first one and it was the building block. Um, I'd love to see, you know, uh, uh, pl platforms like Fortnite and, and others really figure out how to make that easier for, for artists to do. Like I, I obviously my head's not in, in, in the production of those events, but, um, but when I see the experience and the way that particularly in the Travis Scott version, there's kind of trap, they're traveling through the different spaces within the games and, you know, the listening, the being at the concert is sort of, you know, sort of following along with that. Um, you know, I understand these things are, you know, quite difficult to produce and expensive to produce. But I think if they, you know, if those things, those things kind of be brought down and made more kind of plug and play for, for artists and their creative teams to plug into, I think, you know, it, it would just be tremendous. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tuan. Um, we are going to jump to uh, the gentleman to the next of you who's looking very deep, dark and delicious at the moment. Jason Ma, can you hear us? Yes, sir. Okay, you've been you've been super quiet. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna um, wind you up over here, Jason, and, and throw some slides back on again. Um, sure. So uh, yeah, bear with me. Um, but uh, uh, let's see. Did I do this? Can you guys see me? Okay. Close the white screen. Okay. Yeah. Do we have? Okay. So if you notice, the, uh, this is, I think, a very um, typical uh, situation with uh, a lot of executives these days. This is the before COVID and after COVID look. Uh, Jason has, besides building businesses, has grown his beard as well. Um, but a few interesting things that uh, Jason has been involved with. Um, Jason is, is probably one of the most hyphenated people I know in the sense that he's not only an artist, um, an investor, but also an entrepreneur. And among the many projects, which we frankly just couldn't even put on the screen here, um, he was involved with founding 88 Rising, as well as, um, uh oh, there's a white screen. Hold on a second. Just a moment. Are you guys, uh, you guys get a white screen on that one? Yeah, I'm seeing the white yeah, screen. Yeah, it was like a white screen. Okay, you know what? I, I, I think I got it. Yeah. Okay. Now, do we have uh, the screen? Are we, oh, we have there Jason's, I am. We have Jason's mugshot there? Okay, cool. We'll uh, do a, a quick brush through. Among the many companies that uh, Jason's been involved with um, was uh, the Asian um, pop culture channel music movement called 88 Rising, uh, who recently um, did an online concert. Um, now, a lot of people were looking forward to Coachella, obviously for a lot of the big names, but one of the interesting things about this upcoming Coachella was there was gonna be an Asian music stage that was gonna be curated and hosted by 88 Rising. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, um, that stage never happened, didn't see the light of day. However, um, 
AD Rising put together a, uh, a show called Asia Rising Forever in May that featured many of the top Asian and Asian American artists doing a benefit concert. Um, and as you can tell, um, these shots are very small, but it was a great mix of indie icon, as well as um, some even idol acts um, involved. But one of the biggest things that Jason was involved with uh, was a startup called Triller. And, you know, around Christmas time, um, Triller started started making a lot of noise because not only had it quickly become one of the most popular, one of the fastest, and in some media outlets it claimed to be the fastest growing social um, video platform, um, but more importantly, headlines such as in Music Ally said that uh, Triller claimed that uh, it had more users in the U.S. than TikTok. And, you know, things were looking great. Um, Triller had brought on some very high profile, big name artists as investors, but then all of a sudden January hit and Triller went from an app to something much, much more. And so Jason, I wanted to uh, have you step in and step up and sort of talk about um, sort of uh, the, the kind of um, pivot that companies you've worked with, be it ADA Rising, but more importantly, Triller had to go through when um, COVID-19 hit. Got it. Yeah, thanks, Bernie, for having me. Uh, appreciate just being on this panel with friends like Tuin and Michael and Sung. Uh, great supporters of Triller, supporters of AD Rising. Um, I think just going back to, you know, personal experiences and stories. So I think um, Tuin's very familiar because he's a major partner supporter uh, for us at Triller. Uh, but I think, you know, originally what happened was uh, we were going to host a, a co-party um, at, at Coachella for, for Triller. And so it was going to be with the Neon Carnival, et cetera, et cetera. And once everything shut down, of course, everyone freaked out. No one knew what to happen, what was going to happen. And so immediately we had all these artists on Triller that still wanted to perform. Um, and we realized the only way to do that was going to be through a live stream, through through online. And so uh, me and my partners, uh, Ryan, Bobby, and the team uh, that really made it happen, shout out to Nay, Grace, and everyone at Mike Lou, of course, the CEO. Um, we put together the largest online music festival in internet history. And we decided to do it on the weekend of Coachella. And we called it originally, Cotrilla, and we call it the quarantine sessions. And there it was. It, it was to benefit um, charity um, to kids that uh, a charity called No Kid Going Hungry, and also the Recording Academy uh, Music Cares. And the reason why we decided to do was was we realized you know everyone was going to have like Coachella shock that there was no Coachella for the first time in over a decade. And we thought, okay, you know what? Why don't we just bring it online? And so it was kind of crazy how we got it all done. It was literally less, we had weeks, literally weeks. And we somehow lined up 120 plus artists. Um, and we had them all pre-record from their homes or their studios, um, their, their set, their, their performance set. Everyone from Wyclef to Migos to Marshmello to Snoop um, to Monster X. That was super exciting, and they, they shut the internet down when they came on. And then we had it you know, streamed on YouTube, on Twitch, on Caffeine, and it, it just became a huge success. So over 72 hours of music, three days, um, and over that, those three days, we had over 5 million unique visitors, 120 plus artist performance. And it was just, you know, we had never seen this before. It was, it was really, really uh, epic. And I think we hit the Guinness World Book of Record for, you know, the biggest online festival ever. And of course, right after Triller did this, um, and, 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 and in many ways, I would say, then TikTok decided to do their version of it. And then you had Live Aid, and then you had, you know, uh, Global Citizen, and, and everyone kind of just began to ride this train of, you know what, we can still perform, we can still engage with our fans, 
and artists can still connect, but we're just going to do it online. We're going to do it virtually. And so that was really interesting. Um, and one, so, one yeah. Question is, um, you know, obviously I love the name Coachella, but how did it morph into Triller Fest? Um, I think we, we realized very quickly as we were talking to artists that this was bigger than just originally our thinking was, oh, you know what, let's, let's get a few artists, have them perform a few sets during Coachella weekend online. And that'll just be, you know, something for the fans and we'll, and, and we'll give and we'll give and raise money and donate. All of a sudden we started realizing that every single label, every single music manager, every music artist was just like, we want to be a part of this. We want to be a part of this. We want to be a part of this. We, we're itching, we're dying to perform and connect. And then we realized this was just bigger than just a little weekend online you know, festival. It really became a brand. So we were like, you know what? We're not just gonna do this once. We're gonna keep doing this and let's, let's create our own festival brand. So we created Triller Fest. Um, and so that's where you know, we switched it over and we realized that you know, this is something that's gonna be here for a while. Meaning like, we don't know when this coronavirus is ever gonna end. I mean, it, to be honest, it might not ever end if we don't find a vaccine. So we're thinking we'll do Triller Fest again, maybe later in the year, maybe once a quarter, uh, maybe again in 2021. And so we realized we had the ability to create a live stream online music festival brand, the same way you would create it for Coachella or Lollapalooza. This is our version, Triller Fest, and we did it online with first ones to do it. And then of course, 88 Rising, um, originally we're, you know, we're thinking about maybe putting some of the artists on Triller Fest, but then we realized, hey, you know, 88 Rising has its own demographic, its own audience space, its own, you know, platform. And so that came together, you know, very quickly as well, you know, just weeks later. And I don't know if you saw the numbers for uh, Asia, Rising, uh, uh, Asia Rising Festival, but it became the day after the actual four hour online music festival, Asia Rising became the number one trending video on YouTube a day later and it was trending worldwide number one on twitter instagram everywhere and that just shows you the power of asia and that just shows you the power of of just the asian youth audience and gen z and how they're so plugged in to their mobile connections and i thought it was really interesting because everyone was just commenting like i didn't know these artists existed i didn't know there was this artist from malaysia or this artist from philippines or this artist from vietnam or this artist from japan and i thought that was a beautiful thing of just uniting a pan-Asian music moment and a music movement. It was really, really cool. You know, Jason, you, um, you, you put into perspective just how big Triller Fest became. Um, and there was a statistic that I saw online that just blew me away. I wanna share it with everybody. Um, you mentioned that you had 5 million viewers of Triller Fest, is that correct? Correct. At, at the time, and I believe still to this time, the biggest online music festival. Um, to put that into perspective and to kind of wrap our heads around in terms of how important and how impressive that scale is, Shirley uh, Fest was bigger than Bonnaroo, which gets about 80,000 people in attendance, was bigger than Coachella, um, which gets over 100,000, and was bigger than South by Southwest, um, which gets close to 300,000 people. All of these festivals obviously postponed and canceled or delayed for next year. But the fact that you guys pulled this off on such short notice with equal, you know, uh, with a lineup as good or equally better um, than, you know, what people are accustomed to. Um, do you, in terms of sort of plans for 2021, what are <clears throat> things that you guys are looking forward and looking into? Do you continue to see yourselves doing Triller Fest as an annual event? And then obviously, um, you know, Triller went just way beyond being a, a social video app. And now you've got this massive festival um, associated with it. What is sort of um, the roadmap for 2020 and more importantly, 2021? Um, I can't say in detail as far as the roadmap, because I honestly, can, I think everyone on this call is in the same position I am in where we just don't know. Right. So we don't know if it's going to be a physical festival, a half virtual reality festival, an AR festival, or just, you know, what, what type of, you know, experience it will be. I definitely can say that Triller Fest is definitely been in demand across the world now. So we've had requests from India. Uh, not a lot of people know Triller is the number one app in Nigeria. 
number one. I'm talking about above Snapchat, above TikTok, above WhatsApp, above Facebook, above Twitter. It's the number one app overall in, 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 in your Apple store in Nigeria, which is the fifth or sixth you know, most populated country on the planet. Now, why is that unique is because a lot of our user base is urban. And, and, and so a lot of it's hip hop, uh, R&B, you know, that type of urban pop culture. And so what happened was when Migos and 21 Savage and Eminem and Chris Brown, all these, you know, major celebrities and pop stars were posting thriller videos the Afrobeat movement in Nigeria started seeing these on Instagram and started seeing it organically on YouTube, et cetera, et cetera, with the Triller watermark. And so they began to just download Triller and started making their Triller videos from the Afrobeat movement, which has inspired artists today like Drake. And so it was completely organic. We haven't spent a dollar of marketing in Nigeria. And somehow this country of 200 million people Everyone's got a Triller app. Everyone's making Triller videos, and now they want to have Triller Fest in Nigeria. So to me, that's the beauty of things being online, because you can see it virtually everywhere, anyone, anywhere, versus what you just saw right there. How many privileged, cool kids get to go to Coachella, okay, once a year? You know what I'm saying? And like you said, you saw that number. It's 100,000 over two weekends. We had 5 million. Just think about that for a second. You were able to have an online music festival, and I'm sure Michael's going to be able to speak to that. You know, when you have BTS or SM, and all of a sudden K-pop has literally millions being able to tune in and experience their favorite music acts without actually having to go there. I think it's completely changed the landscape. You can actually experience music live today, virtually, and you don't actually have to buy a plane ticket, fly across the world, and be one of those cool kids. You're one of those cool kids you know, just being online. Okay, Jason, before I cut you off, I'm gonna put you on the spot. In the same way that um, with uh, TikTok, people point um, to the success of Lil Nas X vis-a-vis -vis through TikTok, the discovery mm. development and just exploding. Oh, let me talk about this. If you had to pick your sort of thriller version of Lil Nas X, who would it be, where are they from, and why should we be on the lookout for them? First of all, Bernie, I'm, I'm very disappointed that you didn't do your homework on this because Lil, Lil Nas X posted old, <laughs> posted old Town Road on Triller first, okay? Okay, he posted it on Triller from his bedroom. We still have the, the day he loaded it, uploaded it, the video with his Triller watermark, but because TikTok has billions of dollars, okay, they went out and claimed all right, that they discovered Lil Nas X and they broke him and made him whatever, 10X, you know, Diamond Platinum. The reality was when, when Triller was a small little app and we didn't have the marketing dollars, we still don't have those same type of marketing dollars. We just couldn't afford the PR marketing at the time to go claim that story. So the reality is Lil Nas X was, he, broke, he got, his record broke on Triller, period. Drop the mic. And anyone out there that claims it, it was because of TikTok, you know, get your facts straight. Anyone out there with a pen and paper? We just all officially just got schooled. Thank you, Jason, for that insight. Anyways, I love you, Bernie, no matter what. <laughs> all right. <laughs> By the way, love the beard. Keep it. Um, next, we have probably the guy with the best looking mic I've ever seen on Zoom to the date is- I'm not Michael. dropping this. Oh, you, you can't drop it. It's too heavy. Um, but um, now, Michael, a lot of people, um, you know, only really, especially in the K-pop space, only really discovered or heard about you guys very recently. Um, now, you know, the thing is, is that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm friends with your colleague, Key, and uh, he had been sort of whispering to us for over a year about Kissway, Kissway, Kissway. And, you know, for a lot of us, we were really familiar with what you guys were doing in, in the sports space. Um, so I was wondering um, if you could talk about sort of the background that you guys had in sports and how it transitioned over to music. But before we have you dive deep on that, I want to give the, the people out there sort of a little bit of a buildup in terms of sort of how we came to be and more importantly, how we got you here to talk about the show that you recently um, put together. Um, you know, over the past few months, you know, obviously we've heard about a lot of online concerts 
and festivals, but they were mostly um, performances at home and in many cases were for charity where people were either listening or watching um, shows that were sponsored and uh, they were usually within the context of donations, online donations for very good causes, um, you know, to help with, <coughs> um, you know, people around the world in need and who needed attention. Um, but recently, um, one of the biggest music entertainment companies in Korea, SM Entertainment, teamed up with the biggest, one of the biggest tech companies in Korea, Naver, for their video live platform called V Live. And the numbers that came out of the gates was very impressive. Um, I mean, they didn't mince words when they said that this was an over the top live experience. Um, and, you know, the name of the service itself was beyond live, but in many ways it kind of backed up uh, the bravado. Um, in, in late spring, pretty much right after uh, the stuff that Jason was involved with, SM Entertainment Beyond Live announced um, online ticket sales for six of their biggest acts every weekend. And a lot of people were wondering, what is this thing going to look like? And oh my gosh, I mean, the numbers that came out were absolutely mind blowing. Um, and for many people who bought tickets and who logged on and who watched, it wasn't really watching a live concert experience. In many ways, it almost felt like you were watching a live music video experience um, because these shows incorporated elements of augmented reality to go with the performances, the dancing, the singing and whatnot. But given that we are also in a work from home environment right now, um, the band members, uh, the artists themselves could actually interact and see their fans. I mean, this was like Zoom on steroids, you know, at an exponential factor. Um, but one of the biggest tours of the year, BTS, world tours that everyone was looking forward to, uh, was unfortunately delayed, 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 and then just outright canceled. And a lot of fans were very upset as to, you know, how is this going to work? And in late spring, there was a bit of a test run with Bang Bang Con, where it was a weekend full of the best of the best of BTS concerts streamed on YouTube all weekend. And the numbers were just through the roof. Um, you know, during that two, during 24 hours of streaming, it did over 50 million views um, online. And this was, again, the go-to for a lot of artists and people in the industry is, is YouTube. But then Bang Bang Con the Live was announced for June 14th, was just about two weeks ago. And it was not gonna go through YouTube. It was gonna go through the Weverse, its own platform, but more importantly, with Kisway as the technology partner, technology solution. And it was a six camera experience that blew people away, but more importantly, broke records. And according to Variety Magazine, the BTS Bang Bang Con the Live had the biggest, the hugest, the most massive turnout ever. But more importantly, it wasn't just the people. These were paid viewers, paid tickets, um, watched this one of a kind concert. And so without further ado, Michael, I was wondering if you could share with us um, how this all even came about again your, your company is known for its affiliations in sports. You know, and again, a lot of these sports leagues are now coming back online, but how did you get into music? But you know, for those of those out there who don't know much about the sports leagues you're affiliated with, could you just give us a bit of a, a quick breakdown and lowdown of which pro leagues you're involved with? Boy, there's a lot to unpack. So, so thank you, first of all, for that warm up. And I love normally being in the audience, listening to all of these, these, uh, these, these awesome entrepreneurs. So for me to be here, you know, thank you for the, the privilege to, to share our story with you. You know, what's interesting about sports and music is that um, they're both live and they're both different forms of entertainment. And you have an audience that is a fandom, right? So you, you, if, you, if I look at the fandom ship and loyalty of the army for BTS, you know, it's probably exactly the same as, you know, the fandom ship for any major sports organization or sports team, you know. And so there's a lot of commonality 
when you look at, at look at those from the perspective of the audience. The thing that we have always focused on since 2013, when we started the company, um, and I joined later, um, but but in 2013 was there's a huge at home community. And so not everybody goes to the venue and, you know, as, as Jason was saying, is lucky enough to, you know, privileged enough to go to Coachella in person. There's a lot of us that, you know, for me, I had kids, I had to stop going to concerts. Right. But, you know, and others, you just can't get there. And, but I love it, you know, and I love music and I love, you know, watching events. But what we realized is that the at home experience as through a TV, which was kind of like the old traditional medium for experiencing this content is good, but the younger audience is, is experiencing it through a digital device. And those digital devices are really, really cool. They're interactive, they're social, they're personalized. They have all of those attributes, which are awesome. None of which are getting used because we're still producing to the TV and kind of putting it on a mobile device or kind of putting it on a computer. And so, when you sort of look at it we were like, you know, why is that happening? It's so obvious. I mean, you know, just look at our kids. I mean, if I look at my kids, they're, they, they get bored with made for TV content when put on the, on the mobile device. It doesn't matter what it is and what their fandom ship is, they get bored. And we realized, gosh, we, through no fault of the industry, whether it's sports or entertainment or music or anything, even politics, I would call it sort of the new form of MMA or maybe old form of it, it's the original MMA, they're the OGs. Um, I, I think Donald Trump is more of a WWE uh, guy. He, so, yeah. As you, a different, different, pick your battle, right? Um, nonetheless, what we find is that the industry didn't have a set of platforms that allowed them to go really make personalized interactive social content. We didn't have the distribution platforms because the distributions were kind of like a TV, if you will. And, and as a result, the experience for the audience was somewhat the same as it didn't matter if it were live or if it were a replay or in syndicate. In other words, if I'm yelling and screaming and I'm cheering and I look around and nobody notices and nobody cares and nobody hears me, I'm not getting recognized. I don't feel like I matter. And if I'm at home, you know, I'm 10x the audience, I'm 100x the audience of what we have in the venue. And if we can actually go and, you know, we were inspired to go create an experience for the at home audience, where, where they felt included, not, it's not immersive, it's inclusive. And if they felt like they were included, and they felt like they mattered, and they felt like their participation actually was net value to the overall crowd experience and the and the virtual stadium, then we got something. And whether it's sports or whether it's music, look, when, when I go to a concert, it says, I don't want to be the only one sitting in a stage or sitting in a stadium listening to the concert. I mean, that sucks. I want to be there with, you know, 50,000 other people that love that artist as much as I do and are cheering, singing, dancing, crying, whatever they're doing. And I want to feel that. And so we were passionate about building I mean, we're nerds, right? So we're just tech nerds, except Key. Like, he, Key's not a, he's the only non-nerd, but the rest of us, like, we just wanted to build stuff. I, I beg to differ. <laughs> okay, well, I was being polite to him. So, um, but the point being is we, we wanted to build stuff that would enable an experience that we would all really, really enjoy. And then, by the way, you know, here's, here's another thing is you can maybe make a business out of it, which is kind of cool, I think, for the music industry. So when I looked at COVID, COVID was really... All it did was put a spotlight on an issue that has always existed, especially with the advent of digital devices, because more people were at home and not able to go to the venue, which was kind of the, the, the core of how we do all of this and what everybody was used to. So the business model actually just exposed a new, you know, a new opportunity. It just gave oxygen to this. And so now will it go forward? I think people are going to demand to be able to be at home and experiencing these great events and participate. So we were, you, you asked about which, which leagues and which networks. I mean, you know, we're, when, when COVID happened, I mean, um, for us, NBA is one of our major, major customers. And when Adam Silver uh, suspended the, the season, we had one of those, um, you know, for about 24 hours and oh, you know, pick your expletive moment. 
um, saying, you know, we got to reset our numbers. This is going to get ugly. And then we realized everything we built was for digital creation of content for audience specific folks where everybody can be remote. Nobody has to be in a control room. Nobody has to be in a state studio. Nobody has to be in a stadium to go build content for audiences and bring people together. And so we said, well, all of our customers are going to have kind of a problem. They can't just go dark. They've got to go and, and, and create content. So we're really, really lucky. I mean, we, we had kind of a five X growth in the first half of the year of contracts with the major leagues and networks around the world versus what we did in 2019. And, and so we is, picked. And this was before the pandemic hit. You guys were already just kind of on that momentum. Always. Of being yeah. More interactive. And then. Mm -hmm. That's right. So we've been building this in anticipation of the fact that people are going to start to realize that, that the digital audience at home cannot be ignored. And you can't keep serving them the traditional way. So we, we kind of had, you know, fortunate, you know, that my, my colleagues have, you know, incredible insight, you know, into what we thought was the market was going to evolve. And, and so you just had COVID was a catalyst. And if it were not COVID, it would have been another one. It would have been time. It would have been, you know, more cord cutting. It would have been, you know, who knows what it would have been, but people would have realized that the economics of the industry were going to be challenged by non-traditional um, consumption of content. So we, we had to go build those platforms so that way it could support the industry. And the reason nobody knows about us, because we're like, you know, we're like the pipe builders and the service providers underneath it. You know, the people need to know about us, know who we are. And, and we can just go in and help them enable their relationship with their consumer. And so the crossover to sports, to music, we've always been in music. We've just been very quiet about it. So my understanding is you guys have been doing some, for lack of a better word, soft launches or tests with sort of genres like jazz. Mm -hmm. And then also my understanding is, is that um, irregardless of the pandemic, um, you guys sort of did a test run with BTS in Japan during a fan meeting. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that sort of transition and then more importantly, the pivot from sports into the music space. Yeah, and it's not so much a pivot as it is a, um, because we haven't pivoted away from the sports. It, it, is, it is really just, you know, applying our, our capabilities to, to that genre as well. Um, um, certainly we've, we've had a number of, of concert experiences over, over the years playing around with multi-camera, um, you know, and I think what we realized is that it's not about multi-camera, it's about multi-experience. It's about serving a VIP experience and a front row experience and allowing people, it's a backstage experience. It's allowing people to not just pick camera one or camera four. It's about producing two different, different experiences in the audience. Um, the, the, um, the Osaka fan meet was really interesting because it was kind of a quiet little element that we did because there's a lot you have to get right when you go to paid. You have to be able to bring in a rush at the door. And, you know, how many, think back to how many events you remember in recent history where, where somebody bought a ticket, they expected to be able to show up and there was a failure in their admission, you know, in the admission, you know, being able to get into the experience and then they get really, really frustrated. So we had to get that right and really, really get it right. And, and not only then, but actually even interestingly, we were very mindful of what were the security implications of this? What are the ha hacking implications of this? What are the, in fact, actually even DDoS implications of this? Because the K-pop community in particular came out in a very bold way with political statements recently uh, for issues going on in the United States and we expected whiplash or backlash rather. So we really had to prepare ourselves for, for all of that. The other is, is the quality. And I think the other thing is that when people are paying you know, buffering is not tolerable. You can't have buffering. And if your customers in, 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 a, in a country in the network, because there's or a country in the world uh, that doesn't have the greatest network, they still don't want buffering. And so we had to be really, really careful about how we give the top premium experience at 1080p60, you know, to the, with six cameras to people who want it with fast switch capabilities. And at the same time, when somebody has a network that's maybe not up to snuff and shoot my home network is like that when my kids are jamming away on esports, um, I want a great experience as well. And so we had to put a lot, a lot of work into 
the network design and the tech design to be able to overcome that. And that's what the fan meet was, was just really about proving in the tech and then scale it like hell when it came to this latest concert. What, what, what was the scale difference between this December 2019 uh, fan meet in Osaka, Japan, and obviously this recent massive show that you did here in Seoul? What, talk, what kind of scale were we looking at? 10x, 20x, 100,000x? What was yeah. sort of the difference um, in terms of um, scaling up? And then also more importantly, was, was there something that you encountered in that Osaka experiment that you quickly resolved and made sure that it ran smoothly? Um, when the show in Seoul occurred, the um, the 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 fan meet in in December was geofenced to Japan, so it was kind of like five thousand or so, you know, uh, uh, concurrent. So you know, modest in size, um, scaling up to what we did this time around. You know, there, there's a big, 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 big difference when you go from Japan to the world, uh, and you showed that one graph, which was really cool. That was. The things that we added, actually, it wasn't so much that we learned, it was we were bold in our understanding of what we could handle. So we knew we could handle more uh, heck of a lot of viewers. In fact, actually, we didn't even touch the, scratch the surface of what we can handle, um, you know, in this particular load. So th this was, this was uh, there's, a, there's a lot more where that came from. But the important thing that we added and felt bold and confident about our ability to do it was to um, not only handle the interaction with the army bomb light sticks. So we had sort of a Bluetooth connection of all of that, but we had um, 150 million cheers happening, you know, during that event where they were pounding away on these little virtual light stick buttons that were changing in relation to the concert. People are pounding away on this. We didn't know if they were going to do it. So we had about 150 million pounds. We were then taking that all back into a centralized server and we were producing now brand new video that is reflective of the fact that this audience is lighting up the world. So when you really think of that picture, that was a live visual picture of the audience around the world lighting up the world. And we thought that that was a really important way that people were doing their part to say, I'm here, I matter, I'm showing up, I was at this concert and, and you know, I'm lighting up Nigeria or I'm lighting up. Uh, I mean, it was, it was in, you know, really it was all over the world. It was really, really cool. And so we had to be pretty, pretty ambitious to be able to pull that off. Uh, we felt pretty good about it. And, you know, by the way, there's a ton more that we can do. Um, the thing that we think about very hard and, and what, uh, by the way, what Beyond Live has done with Neighbor or what Neighbor has done, you know, hats off. To, well, I'll do it. Hats off. And I have a COVID haircut. Um, uh, you know, I, I just love the innovation that's happening. There's so much opportunity for us to, to take advantage of this uncertainty as entrepreneurs and go for it. I mean, that's, that's where innovation happens. So I, I love what they were doing with, um, with being thought leaders on, on kind of the zoom walls, if you want to call it that our point of view, because we deal with like major leagues and major networks and major sports is you have to produce that. So that has to be moderated because we can't have like streakers showing up behind BTS that just doesn't work very well. So you've got to be, um, you have to be really mindful of, of, you know, producing experience for the audience, but also producing an experience from the audience. And, and that's where we're, we're really careful about how to do that in a, you know, in a mature, thoughtful way. Uh, so, you know, again, I'm, I'm just blow, it just blows me away that, that this 5,000 person experience in Osaka, Japan exploded into I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, the numbers that I heard was 750,000 people viewed, paid for tickets that were anywhere between 25 to 35 US dollars a pop. Obviously, many of them bought merchandise, whether it was <clears throat> the light stick, t-shirts or whatnot. And then more importantly, was in light of the fact that BTS canceled their world tour, that one show, from my understanding, was the equivalent of 15 sold out arena arena or stadium shows. So essentially, they could have hit their milestones of a world tour with this one show vis-a-vis -vis through the Kisui mobile technology. One last yeah. question um, before I move on to Sung Moon, who has a lot of data on the impact of that show, is the monetization. I think mm -hmm. this is something that blew people away was obviously the technology was impressive, but the fact that you guys were able to monetize this concert experience. How integrated is the ticketing and the commercial aspects of the show with the technology that you have? And, is, and more importantly, is this something that you're gonna hopefully roll out 
for other acts, other artists, other, you know, music companies in the near future. So you have to be very, very, um, I'll call it nerdy and tech oriented to make sure that the ticketing agency and the payment platform um, is well, well integrated with the admission controls, you know, and, and get that all to work. So it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of scaling. We had to build some, some crazy tools because they don't exist to go and beat the heck out of the servers, you know, to say, I'm going to, in each region have massive admission, you know, and then also fake people, you know, trying to get in because everybody's going to try to get in and make up their own little ticket thing, uh, you know, in order to get in. So you've got to be able to handle a lot of load. And that, that was a, that was a big, big test element. Um, we are right now, as a result of this, I think everybody realized we can go make money and it's not, it's net new money. Right. I, you know, we're going to get back to the touring world. The, the world is going to have an, a new normal and I can't wait for it. Um, but there is going, this is net new money that can be captured for these artists and, and fuel the industry. I love it. And I want to go see it and be a part of it and make it happen. Um, and, and it can be done cost effectively. And I think that's a, you know, you can really focus in on EBITDA for the industry. And I think that's really, really important. Um, so we want to be a part of that. We're getting inbounds from, everywhere to say what did you guys do how did you do it you know can we go do that as well and what elements can you bring to us that are going to be really important for our you know for our audience and for our artists because not everybody's bts right so everybody's going to need a different you know i don't need seven cameras on on a on a piano um but but we can offer different experiences and i think that's what we're really you know excited to go in and try to figure out what tomorrow looks like no, that's fantastic. That's awesome. Thank you, Michael. Um, and to sort of put sort of context to the content that we just saw recently produced through live streaming concerts, just through traditional even music streaming, I am going to not drop the mic, but hand the mic off to Sung Moon Cho. Um, and to wind him up, mm -hmm. I also got slides made for him as well. Thank so you. bear with me. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, can you see the slides? Yes, yes. Everyone's good? Okay. So one of the interesting things that um, people in the, <coughs> pardon me, that's um, one of the most interesting things that came out as soon as the uh, COVID-19 um, pandemic hit, not only the headlines, but more importantly, um, across Europe and uh, North America and Asia was um, what was trendy. Uh, a lot of people saw that video games and OTT platforms like Netflix were doing double to even triple digit growth. But for some odd reason, um, a lot of industry pundits and a lot of industry publications were stating that uh, the early indicators, the early data was showing that for some odd reason, music streaming wasn't exploding in growth. In fact, it might not even be growing at all. And in many ways, um, the curve was not bending, it was flat. If anything, it was dipping a little bit. And so headlines like what we saw here in Rolling Stone were stating that music streaming is down in the time of social distancing. And that for many people in the industry was a depressing thought because live music revenues is a good chunk of what many artists make. And to have what looked like an engine becoming a safety net streaming music was in some ways being questioned as well in terms of their durability and viability moving forward over the next few weeks, next few, few, few months, and then you know, even through next year. Um, but one of the interesting things about uh, Sun Moon and his team and his crew over chart metric was um, they kind of pushed back on this narrative and sort of this optic and this lens that somehow music streaming was being adversely affected. Um, this is something I have to just put out there for anybody who's interested in uh, music data written in a very uh, elegant, easy, and uh, fun read is um, the blog site that Chartmetric puts together called Beats and Bytes. Um, it puts a lot of stories as well as analysis uh, into current trends in the music industry. And one of the things um, that's been fascinating over the past few months and the past few weeks is uh, not actually Sung Moon, but his colleagues have been very prolific writers as well as participants on other webinars around the world talking about 
COVID-19's effect on the global music business. And again, if you go onto their Beats and Bytes blog site, um, they have three incredible reports that have been shared um, by many other media outlets, and again, and many other webinars um, about the impact on music genres, geography, and live streaming artists. And so without further ado, Song Moon, talk to us about uh, what you started seeing um, immediately during and sort of as things are transitioning um, in relation to COVID-19's impact and effect on the music industry. A lot of these, uh, yeah, thank you, Bernie. Um, so that's a nice slide, thanks. Um, so a lot was discussed already about the impact, immediate impact and long-term impact. So I'm, I, will, I will not repeat them. And a lot of analysis, you know, like um, discussed so far, how this pandemic has been a catalyst and really pushed forward to digital transformation rather than slow, slowing down some, you know, areas. So I agree with all of them. Um, and that's uh, what we found out through our research as well. Uh, there was a, this immediate uh, impact on the music streaming consumption uh, and also our on our revenue and like uh, customer like activities as well, user activities as well. Right after the pandemic, uh, people scaled back uh, and they, you know, like they were scared about the outlook, economic outlook. So they reached out to us, hey, I'm really not sure about our company, our future, please cancel my subscription for now. We'll see. And many of these came back and, you know, just a month later. And also we have the record number of users signing up right now. Uh, so it's a total transformation to digital. So one interesting, like about the COVID analysis, uh, you can, you know, the audience can re go and read more. We did it in three different parts. One is journal by journals, uh, journal by journal. Was there the impact of the COVID as more on like journal specific um, in the country music? Is it up or down? Because people are not driving and people consume country music through car radios in Midwest a lot. They don't drive, so no radio. So do, do they consume less country music? So that was one interesting um, idea, assumption. And kids and children's music go up, of course, uh, no doubt about it. How about classical music or opera? Um, is the consumption going up or down? How about pop, hip hop, uh, or you know other like uh, you know those those musics uh, or rock uh, and or metal? So that was the first part. We found out about you know like a couple things and country music some impact, but not much. The car, like we looked at only the streaming uh, radio uh, platforms. So, and then also, yeah, we looked at the airplay as well, but uh, you know, the airplay is still happening. People may consume less on car, in the cars, but they all have Amazon music subscription. Uh, Amazon music has been very strong with country music from the beginning. So that is going well. Um, and uh, hip hop and pop, uh, very stable. People consume a lot. New releases stopped. Uh, many, many big artists uh, delayed uh, some big releases, but that uh, was just you know because of that. You know that huge consumption that comes after right after the new releases stopped. But that consumption was still happening to more artists, to more different, uh, to more variety. So that was happening, and then the second part was country by country, and third part was live music versus you know those people who are taking this uh, live events to online versus who do not. Uh, are there some meaningful difference, statistically uh, meaningful differences? Do we do we see? So that was another uh, analysis. So in, in terms of yeah. genres that surprised you in terms of the numbers going up and then obviously as well um, genres that surprised you in terms of numbers that went down, if you had to pick one that went up and one that went, that went down, what would they be? So uh, yeah, like many of these were not so obvious when we looked at the data, but um, uh, 
Yeah, like as I mentioned, children's music and classical music to some degree, like classical uh, music, um, you know, people listen to you know, like peaceful music at home, you know, at work. So those were good. Um, uh, the one that got hit um, was uh, like initially pop music a little bit and then yeah, quick, quickly came back. So yes, so yeah, that didn't see huge, like much impact on like something going down. And then in the part two of your report, um, you, you broke it down by geography, Asia, Europe, North yeah. America. Um, were there consumer listener behaviors that were perhaps similar or, or in some ways, you know, um, surprisingly different in terms of people's reaction to uh, their music yeah. consumption and, and um, their, their reaction to uh, the new normal environment yeah. of stay at home, work from home, lockdown mode. Right, right. Um, so, let me... So yes, so country by country, by country um, some countries went through this, uh, like it got hit back back then. Italy was hit back and Spain as well. Uh, Korea was hit earlier and then recovered. Uh, there was no lockdown in the end uh, or shelter in place. So country by country, we saw some different impact and that was also similar, uh, you know, like usually when the COVID like infiltrates a country, so that there was there was a delay. Uh, you know, this happened to Korea, Korea and China, Asian countries first, and then Europe later, and then United United States. So with that, we could see that panic, the impact of the panic, people scaling down quickly on everything, but uh, like a few days later. Ah, interesting, you know, a few days later, people realize that the life goes on uh, and they have to listen to music still. Um, so that was like, that correlation was interesting. Um, big hit, uh, some dip and recovery following afterwards. So and then, and then with part three of your report, um, you know, you obviously talked about live streaming artists, but not just concerts you talked about and did a, a, a really interesting deep dive on yes. um, non-performance live streaming. Could you share with us some really interesting discoveries of what music artists have been doing during this downtime to increase their fan base? Um, you know, again, there were some really interesting studies and you, you covered a lot of very interesting examples that I had never seen before related to what some hip hop and R&B artists were doing versus those in the hard rock and heavy metal space, and then just bored pop stars. What were sort of interesting new developments, uh, new trends, or, or frankly, new forms of entertainment that emerged in the live streaming space that uh, you guys were able to do a uh, data yeah. analysis on? So one interesting, uh, one interesting find well, around that was fans, you know, like they, are used to seeing these big stars in um, these talk shows or big, you know, national TV shows or through concerts. Fans constantly look these look at these artists that they love, you know, like go big and do some like you know performances out there. And when things scale down, you know, fans are hungry for that, eager to see more. So. When these artists, uh, they took more to Instagram live, uh, interacting with fans that way. Or uh, something else we saw was a guest starring and someone else's channel um, side by side. And we saw a lot of these uh, like people, uh, artists, guest starring, gaining a lot of Instagram fans that way. So a lot of these were happening anyway before but uh, we saw that uh, the impact was amplified uh, you know, during this COVID. So one artist, um, yeah, we can, I can actually do a quick screen share uh, to show that graph. Um, yes, this, this is the one that I was, yeah, I was before and about. after live streaming, you see the number of uh, Instagram followers, how uh, it has jumped uh, quickly. So this is uh, one of the more dramatic examples 
Um, um, so that was um, like Badu gained 500% more followers and Scott gained seven, like almost 800%, um, uh, you know, uh, be, 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 uh, before and after, after. So that was interesting. And then you can see from this graph as well, how this, you know, like the entire numbers quickly jumped from right there. So we went on uh, that way, comparing these two, Tori versus Tyler Sign, because, you know, like, um, you know, like the more active you are during this period, you know, during this pandemic on like through online uh, interact, in, uh, interactions, does it uh, really you know, pay off? You know, do, do artists gain more followers and more um, engagements through this? So that was, yeah, quickly. Great, thank you so much, Sung Moon. That's incredible. And for those of you out there, please check out the uh, Chartmetric blog called Beats and Bytes, as well as, um, if you can, subscribe to their service. Um, it's a fantastic site for those of you who want to know how your favorite artists are doing yeah. around the world in real time, anytime, on almost any platform. I, I know I, we are running out of time, but uh, since we talked about BTS a lot, can I show you it's just like something interesting here that I found sure. out. So this is Chartmetric, uh, BTS profile. And the one thing you see is um, we just recently added TikTok. So Triller, Jason, let's talk about Thank that. Thank you. Have that data. So uh, they have humongous number of fans on, on TikTok, <laughs> uh, 28th in the world. Compared to other artists, uh, they have more fans on TikTok than uh, Kyle Jenner, actually, in, in terms of TikTok follower count. So that is impressive. Uh, but, and, and also like their songs are trending on TikTok. So that's one thing. But what I want to show you is uh, this, this trend, uh, BTS, during this pandemic, last three months, when you look back, uh, or if I zoom out to the last six months, this type of online activities, people following and you know like interacting with the artists on Instagram, that was the COVID um, around uh, like you know that's when it happened in China, and a little later March, eight, uh, February and March it became more obvious, and then it hit everywhere in the world by the time when it's uh, like March end of March or April, uh, things are just um, like you know like business as usual. Uh, people, you know, online, online activities still happen. Uh, this is TikTok follower count um, rapidly growing. Um, but what I want to show you is actually this YouTube daily video views. So this is when, um, so 30 million video views per day happened on May 30th and another big spike happened uh, around June 10th. So that was you know, these were all like events that were planned. Uh, they were all actually canceled, uh, but we still have the data, like planned data. Um, uh, we had, uh, you know, all, the, all of these BTS uh, events. But uh, compared to actually like, you know, like going back in time, back in February, you know, they had huge number of views per day. Like what happened around that time was when they appeared a lot on these Night show with Jimmy Fallon and uh, late night, late late show with James Corden. So that shows the impact of this mainstream media still having on people, and that is not happening these days. People still watch these James James Corden shows, but that impact is not as big uh, as national television, like you know, well created uh, TV shows. So I think that is one of the things to maybe. Uh, keep in mind the digital marketing has been always 365 days constant effort rather than one huge marketing spend million dollars and then die down quickly that was more like physical world uh, uh, show now that everyone is forced to be uh, like 100% digital uh, I would say that it became more important than ever to be active um, instead of one huge blow and just, you know, be quiet instead of that, constantly yeah. uh, 
being active on different platforms and engaging with fans. Uh, you know, all, all, you know, only those uh, artists who strive more will, yeah, gain more attention. Thank you so much, Sungun. That was impressive. And thank you for uh, a, a nice, lovely plug of the site and the service right at the end. You, uh, you uh, Pictures are worth a thousand words, but a, a moving website page like that, that's so active and dynamic, <laughs> it's probably worth a million words. So thank you. Um, we're running a little over time, which is fine. So if you guys are okay with answering a few questions, um, some really interesting ones came through. Um, some are a little bit tech related, but um, the first question is for Michael, and I think this one hopefully will be a short one, is um, <clears throat> there were some BTS fans out there who were wondering how you were able to sort of combat um, piracy. Obviously, there are going to be people looking for ways and means to hijack the stream and you know, possibly maybe put it on a different service, a different server, different website, or you know, stash it somewhere so that they could resell it. Um, how did you guys clamp down on that? And more importantly, how effective was it? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I also tried to answer in text. Um, uh, if you go into the answered section, just, um, but there are companies that are really good at, at video fingerprinting and, and we partnered with them. That's for the live detection as well as for the VOD detection. And then they scour all the sites that are out there for uploads. You have to partner with those fingerprinting companies and then you have to, partner with the social distribution companies the video distribution companies in order to make sure that your takedown requests are active. So it's a little bit of a uh, whack-a-mole. Uh, you know, I have to be honest, uh, you, you, you have to be really, really on top of it. That was actually, that was my job as a CEO uh, because I couldn't help it with anything else. I was in whack-a-mole mode to, to go in and make sure that we protect that. But, you know, fortunately, I think the, the state of the art with um, uh, solutions out there are it's pretty advanced and I can't really share and I won't share some of the secret sauce that we have because that would sort of tip off people who are going to go steal stuff. And, and, uh, but you know, pirate management is, is a, is an important technology. We, we worked really hard on it. Right. This next question is um, open to anybody. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously we were talking about um, best case examples, best practices of major pop, massive music artists who've succeeded in transitioning um, their stadium arena tour experiences into something interactive um, and online. <coughs> online. Um, but for many independent artists, those who are emerging artists, um, whether they be songwriters or producers, what should they be focusing on in these um, current times? And then more importantly, um, you know, obviously they don't have the financial backing or resources that say a BTS or, you know, Super M would have. Um, what are sort of alternatives, options, or um, possibilities out there um, with a lot of the stuff that we discussed today? I'm gonna throw it to uh, Tuhin over there um, because I know you work very closely with a lot of startups and also obviously universal music is, is very deep with discovering and developing acts um, for an emerging act, listening to oh, all of the yeah, I got a couple. I've got a couple thoughts about that. Um, I mean, first of all, you know, I think it's a pretty good time to be releasing music as an independent artist because a lot of major artists have pushed back their releases um, indefinitely or torn up, uh, you know, their EP and decided to do something else. <clears throat> so I think generally there's less slightly less competition for, you know, major playlist spots. So, um, you know, I, almost any artist can get access to a distribution channel and most dis many distribution channels come with some potential access to marketing, you know, to the services for their own playlists. Um, so that's, that's one thing, but here's what I'll say, which is non-specific, but, um, but I think really is where you get an advantage. There are a lot of great technologies out there for measuring whether your song is likely to succeed, figuring out who to market it to, looking at how it's uh, uh, you know doing through analytics um, with algorithmic recommendations about what you should do as next steps. So you know, and as a big company, we have a very sophisticated you know stack of technologies that we use along that whole process. 
Um, but oftentimes, I'd say more than ever, really, there are technologies that are available for you know a few dollars a month um, to uh, to build your career. And so, you know, um, I'm not, I won't get into any specific one and promoting them right now. But I think if you if you look at you know kind of the process of what should I record, who should I record with, um, you know which of those tracks should I release? How should I market them? How should I monitor how they're doing? Um, there's there's a, a lot of great tools out there right now. Um, this next question is uh, for Jason. Um, for emerging acts who are interested in using Triller um, for marketing and promotions, are there any resources online that can sort of help um, accelerate people's ability to adapt and more importantly to really um, use Triller to its fullest potential. Is there something out there that you recommend would be a good place to quickly get up to speed and learn what the, uh, the benefits are of using Triller? Yeah, it's called the App Store. Um, <laughs> download it. Um, I would just say that there are, uh, no, no, it's not. Jokes aside, I, there are tutorials on YouTube. There are tutorials um, on Instagram. And if you go to the Triller page, uh, it shows you, like, recently we have an inter, uh, a, a partnership with Snap, with Snapchat now. So you can actually go to the Triller website or go to the Triller Instagram page, and it'll show you how to actually upload to Snapchat or vice versa. So what's really cool with our partnership with Snap now is that all the filters and all the tools in Snap and all the AR filters can now also be used in Triller and vice versa. So you can actually take all the technology and all the toolkit inside of Snap and use them in your Triller videos to post to Snap and to other platforms. So that's uh, actually go to our Instagram page, uh, just at Triller Vids, V-I-D-S. T R I L L E R V I D S, and you'll see the tutorials there. Um, it's very, very fairly simple. Um, I think it's just you know very similar to TikTok. Just download it, um, start using it, start playing with it. Uh, there's going to be new AI that we're incorporating and continually uh, unfolding uh, in our new iterations of 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 of, of both iOS and Android uh, that are very, very impressive and will make your experience even easier. Uh, that will technically edit for you uh, to different music and different beats. I think one thing that's unique about Triller, a lot of people ask, like, what's the difference between TikTok and Triller? Uh, I've seen it written in an article once that uh, they compared TikTok to Disney Plus, and, they con and then they compared Triller to Apple Plus. Uh, another article said uh, TikTok was more like America's Got Talent. It's just random and just a bunch of rando and funny, crazy, you know, stupid stuff. And Triller was more like MTV, BET, TRL. Um, so I think in that sense that Triller truly is music industry focused. We are for the music industry, supported by the likes of TuneIn, at UMG, Sony, Warner. We have all licenses so that any song that you post up to 60 seconds with the Triller watermark, it does not get taken down on any platform because we have those licenses, uh, thankfully, through great partners like UMG and TuneIn. Uh, secondly, uh, you can actually play Apple Music and soon Spotify, Deezer, all through the Triller app. So what happens if you're an artist is if you actually put your song on Triller and you actually get plays on your track inside with Apple Music, you get paid. So the label gets paid and uh, the artists get paid. And so the, you don't get that on Tic Tac. You don't get that on anywhere else. So that's really unique. So like when The Weeknd launched his single, Heartless, his first single in two years, exclusively for the first week on Triller, it got 70 million views and tens of millions of streams on Triller. You did which not have to... Which huh? artist was this? The Weeknd. Oh, The Weeknd. Yeah. Okay. I was yeah, thinking so the, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I didn't realize you were talking about the other. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this one artist called Sunday, this other artist called Saturday. Uh, no. So The Weeknd dropped it and it broke. Double platinum on Triller. So what's unique if you're an artist is that your music getting played through Apple Music or Spotify inside Triller, you're actually getting paid. It counts as a stream. So that's very, very unique to what Triller does. And I think that's why we focus on being a artist first, music artist first, and music ecosystem platform for music fans.
That's fantastic. I had no idea. Thank you for that enlightenment. I'll, um, I'll just give a little mm -hmm. extra plug um, sure. to Triller, which is that um, because Triller is really completely music focused um, and TikTok has evolved to be short form YouTube in a, in a way and, you know, I'm getting personal development advice, I'm getting financial advice and, you know, I don't know, fixing cars, whatever, which is great. And there's a lot of, you know, yeah. there's a lot of great content on TikTok. Uh, but if you're a music artist and you're looking to break, um, you know, I think you're going to find your audience more concentrated on a service like Triller than you are TikTok today. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tuan. Mm -hmm. And then the last question um, is actually for Sung Moon. Yes, yes. Um, in light of, you know, obviously, um, Chart Metric and your team have been carefully tracing not only the movement of music artists vis a vis through DSPs, International Digital Music Services, and um, its impact and its influence on their social media platforms and social media accounts and social media just activity as a whole. Mm -hmm. In light of recent developments um, with K pop, not just fans, but K pop stands in terms of what they're doing in the social media space when it comes to uh, social issues, whether it's U.S. politics to Black Lives That Matter. Um, do you plan on monitoring and tracing um, and studying the activity of perhaps certain K-pop acts, their fans' interaction, social media traffic, and sort of seeing what its impact is um, in non-music items, non-music issues. Oh, the, like crossing that vertical. I mean, like right now, so far, we've been tracking music related um, topics so far, but the question is, can we go beyond the Im impact of music or artists, K-pop artists on social? I think the question is alluding to, um, for instance, you know, recently with, uh, President Trump's um, uh, Oklahoma gathering, you know, his mm -hmm. team was thinking they were going to have tens to hundreds of thousands of people showing up. And it turns out um, they could barely pack an arena. And a lot of that was attributed to um, TikTokers or, you know, Zoomers, Generation Z, but also K-pop fans, K-pop stands. Um, and so, you know, given the activity, the highlight, the spotlight on K-pop fans in the social media space. Um, is there a way or is there something that um, you might be able to mon um, monitor and then perhaps analyze in terms of social media activity mm -hmm. by the artists or by their fans on these accounts yeah, um, yeah. in non-music spaces? Um, yes, interesting idea. Like I don't have, uh, we haven't thought about that actually. I haven't thought about that. Uh, we have been very much focused on music space, uh, music listeners so far. So we actually did a project uh, on political campaign once, uh, or but uh, that was just one of projects. But that was interesting. You know how you know such given that it's such a cultural um, domain that uh, how the fans of these, these artists can have impact on other uh, sectors. Uh, I think it's a very interesting topic, so. Yeah, I would just, I love this idea. Like I, I'm seeing, um, you know, like an impact chart, social impact chart. Like exactly. what artists are having the most social impact and it, we'll leave it up to Sung Moon to, um, figure out how you measure that and how you yes. measure it consistently. But I mean, if we could foster the same kind of competition we have just for, you know, chart position around actually driving social impact, which most artists want to do anyway, wow. um, that would be an amazing innovation. And I think just, you know, an incredible social differentiator for, for chart metrics. Yeah, social impact chart or social impact uh, algorithm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Makes sense. That makes sense. Great idea. That's a very interesting homework assignment. Now, yeah. thank you so much for your time. We're yeah. going to wrap up. We ran a little bit over, but one of the last questions, I'm just going to have everybody to just do a quick speed round. Um, for 2020, if there's one thing that you think we should be looking out for, it could be a platform, it could be a person, it could be a technology, it could be a company. 
if you had to pick one thing and, you know, again, feel free to plug your own company. I'm not going to say Jason, but um, if there's one thing we should be on the lookout for for 2020 that we should be excited about that uh, is related to taking us to uh, new experiences um, and new places, what would that be? Um, Michael, you're thinking really hard, so I'm going to leave you for last. Um, but uh, Jason, what should we be on the lookout for for 2020? What's your um, vision for 2020? I think be on the lookout for more immersive experiences. So VR, virtual reality, augmented reality. I've had at least a dozen pitches over the last three months during pandemic of just doing full blown performances in AR and VR. And we were able to feature that. We just featured uh, Busy Bone from Bone Thugs and Harmony. Um, he just did a whole virtual reality music video. And I think you'll see a lot more volumetric actual live performances in VR and AR. And I think uh, Wave, shout out to Adam Origo. I know he's got something going on that's going to be really, really dope. And um, I, I think you're just going to see more and more of that virtual idols, virtual, virtual stars uh, that are literally, you know, avatars. Uh, we're seeing that already in China and Japan and, it, and, and the U.S. So I think we'll see more and more of that. Jason, that was two, but that's good. You forgive him. Tuhin, what do you think? What should we be on the lookout for for 2020? I think you should be on the lookout for the ways that this, uh, this COVID-19 crisis is going to create permanent changes in culture to, um, you know, to add a lot of focus on social justice, on environmental issues. Um, I think that, I think culture is going to change because of this. And, you know, if you're an artist or your company, you got to be speaking to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I would say watch party. It's something I tried recently. Um, and, you know, not now that even like, you know, very close friends, uh, they cannot be together um, um, or couple, couples, you know, they are forced to be apart. So, you know, those couples who used to enjoy watching something together, uh, movies, uh, these days, there are a couple of solutions, but it's not perfect yet. So I actually recently uh, found out about this one, uh, you know, like a product, and then I was quite fascinated. So, like that's one example, but something that you know we are so used to having you know, like in physical space, and still something that's not really translated to digital. There are still those things, and watch party. I think what is one area still that we are not there yet. When, you know, with okay. And last but not least, Michael, you've been in yeah. deep thought. Yeah, I was. There's just so many, so much to pick from. I think the industry is going to go through a uh, an an economic transformation as we try to, you know, as we've done so many times in the past, and this is an opportunity to do it again. Uh, but I'm just going to pick up on what someone said, and and that is, I it, in our language, I think the concept of a virtual stadium is mm -hmm. something that we've we've never really. In, in, in a way that's authentic and meaningful, I think is really important. So I, I love all the VR tech that's been out there and AR tech, and, and that's a new way to see it. But it, the question is, how am I seen as an audience member? And I, and I, and I think people want to feel like they're engaged and involved and, and they matter. And so I see a lot of people playing around with that with artificial crowd noise. I'm not sure I love that yet, but I think it's down the path of saying, let's go help people feel like they're participating in the event of matter. And, and I think you're gonna see some really cool innovations that, 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 that create, I call it inclusive, not immersive. I, I'm really excited about what's gonna happen there over the next years. Thank you so much. That is a great theme to wrap up on, inclusive and not, inter not just interactive. So thank you to Michael, Song, Tuhin and Jason. Um, thank you so much for spending time and, and more importantly to all of the attendees out there. Um, this will hopefully be the first of many Spark Labs uh, webinars. And you know this will be building up hopefully to uh, demo day later in the year in November. So this is Bernie Cho, the moderator. Thank you for putting up with all my little tech glitches and gaps. Hopefully the next time we get together, it'll be a lot smoother. But thank you again so much for all your questions, all your feedback, and again, Stay safe, and we look forward to hopefully catching up with you all very soon in person, but if not, online is almost as good, if not better. Thank you. Bernie is the man. Thank you, Bernie. Excellent moderation. Okay. And thank Take you, care, uh, everyone Thanks, who stayed. We've got a, like, a great Good group work. all the way to the end, so excellent. Right.
work participants. Thank you, everyone. All right, thank you. Bye.